As you're being seated there, I want to invite you to grab your copy of God's Word and turn to Genesis chapter 1 and Romans chapter 1. Uh, and we begin a brand new series today uh, entitled Golden Oldies. We're over the next couple of weeks, uh, June and July. Uh, we're going to be looking at some very familiar Old Testament uh, stories and really kind of uh, put a fresh look and take a fresh take on them and remind us not of just the story, but ultimately the meaning behind it. And today we look at uh, the idea of creation. When we think about God spoke the world into existence, uh, we need to go to Genesis chapter 1 and also Romans chapter 1 and really see what it's like. Now, here's what I also understand, that everybody in this room and everybody uh, that is viewing us online, there are a couple of questions we all have to answer. And the way we answer these questions really is going to set our eternity and ultimately our destiny. Uh, the first question we all have to answer it's a question of origin. Where did we come from? Where did it all come from? And I'll submit to you, you basically have two options. Either there is a God that created everything, that a God that created you and me in his image. He's got a plan in it all. That is one of your options when you think about answering the question as to origin, where does it all come from? Or you go to the other end, there is no God and it's all just happened by accident. Every one of us in this room has to answer that question. And if this has all happened by accident, there's really no reason for us to be here. There's no reason for you and I to have any hope of a better tomorrow or even a hope of a better eternity. We all have to answer the question, where did it all come from? Did it come from God? or something else. I think there's a second question we all have to answer, whether we're in this room or viewing online, is the question of identity. Who are we? Who am I? Well, we're going to look at today the reality God's Word says is that everyone in this room, everybody viewing online, we were specifically and especially created in the image of God. That regardless of what others think about you, regardless of what the world thinks about you, regardless of what anybody thinks about you, that you are a created person in the image of God. That's one option. The other option is you're just simply the highest of the evolutionary chain. Not much meaning, not much significant. You're just a little more advanced than other animals. That is a question of who am I? We all have to ask, answer the question and ask the question of where did we come from, origin, what about our identity? I, I think another one we have to ask, everybody in this room, we have to ask the question of meaning. Man, what does this all mean? What does this all mean? I think for those of us who are followers of Christ and read God's Word, man, here is the meaning is that God loved us so much that when he decided to create a world and create you and me, that he didn't want to make us robots that had to sing his praises and had to fully and always follow him. God instead chose to love us so much that he created a world where we were free to receive him and accept him or also reject him. That is one option. But even for those who rejected him, though we've fallen in sin, that same God who loved us so much to create us as free individuals to accept him or reject him, then provided a way of salvation for all of our sins to ultimately be forgiven. That's one option when it comes to meeting. The other option is there is no God. Therefore, there really is no right or wrong. Which leads to the next question is, what is right and wrong? If there is no God, then there is no ultimate standard. There's no reason for us to try to be good. We should simply live if we believe that we're just the highest of the naturalistic, atheistic, uh, evolutionary, macroevolutionary, or uh, uh, the evolutionary process. Then all we need to understand is this it is the survival of the fittest if there is no God. And so what you do really doesn't matter. However, if you believe there's a God, 
And God has ultimately set a standard by which he wants his people to live and all of his children to live, that there are things that are right and things that are wrong, then we need to live according to that way. I think there's one final question we all have to answer. And it's the question of destiny. Where is everything headed? If I believe there's a God who existed in eternity past and will exist in eternity future, and I believe there's a God who's got a plan for me and a plan for you, and God has laid out the red carpet of salvation and forgiveness for everyone who would believe they could spend eternity with Him forever, that is an amazing destiny that you and I can share in. However, if I don't believe there's a God, there's no need to believe in destiny. We're just going to live a few more days, breathe a little bit more, eat a few more meals, and then we die and it's nothing. Those are some big questions that we all have to answer. And how you and I answer those questions will ultimately determine how much we enjoy the life that God has given us. Now, I'll acknowledge when it comes to the idea of God and we think and talk about today about creation, I'll acknowledge that that there are some reasons that people have for rejecting the idea of God. I think it's very common today that that people have personal objections uh, to believing in God, that they don't want to believe in a God because they don't want anybody to tell them how to live their life. How many of you understand what I'm saying? They want to live life a certain way. They want to do a certain thing. They want to be free to sin or live this way or that way. And I don't want there to be a God because I don't want there to be some set of external standards that I'm supposed to succumb to and submit to. I think that some people, it's, it may not be that some people uh, reject God because of a personal reason or personal objection. They just want to live life. I think sometimes people kind of reject the idea of God for emotional reasons. And and these are legitimate. I think there are times that uh, maybe someone's been through something in their life. They've experienced some uh, amazing amount of pain. And maybe they kind of ask the question, man, if there's so much evil, there can't be a good God. Or God, if you loved me emotionally, how could you have allowed this to happen to me? I think there are people that are in those spaces and, and maybe the emotion goes uh, this way. Maybe it's a little more that they say, you know what? And man, I look around, a lot of people are Christians and they, they kind of don't live like they say they should be living. They kind of live in a hypocritical fashion. I think there are times that, that people emotionally reject the faith because they've encountered Christians that didn't live the way God, that we, the way we should as followers of Christ. I think there are some reasons that are that way. So some people, man, they want to reject the idea of God because they want to live the way they want. Others reject the idea because of some emotional pain or hurt and heartache. I think there are times also that some people reject God and the idea of God for intellectual reasons. I think there are sometimes that they'll, uh, uh, they'll say, you know, doesn't science disprove God? And, and I want you to know the simple answer to that question is no. Yes, there are some scientists who reject the idea of God. But can I remind you of this in this space and in this time, science doesn't say anything, scientists do. We've all kind of learned that the last 12 months, haven't we? How many times have we heard we're going to follow the science? And we don't follow the science, we follow a scientist. It's who's interpreting the data. And what's the purpose behind the message they're sending us, right? So here's the point, folks. The data is real that we live in a universe that is fine-tuned, specifically created to sustain life. And the chances of that happening is nil by accident. The only way it could happen is if there is, in fact, a creator of the universe who set everything into place so that you and I could eat and breathe and live and interact with each other. 
So I want you to know if you are sitting here today or you're viewing this online and you kind of have an intellectual objection to the idea that there is a God, maybe you call it science, I want to encourage you to move beyond just listening to a certain set of scientists who for a certain set of reasons want to say there is no God. I, I think there's another intellectual reason, and this is legitimate, it is the problem of evil. Some people intellectually, uh, maybe it's not science, but intellectually they'll say, you know, if there is a good, all-powerful God who created this universe, why is there evil? Anybody ever ask that question? That's a legitimate question. I will tell you as a pastor, that is a legitimate question. That is one that I believe is the hardest for us as followers of Christ to deal with, that if we believe there's an all-powerful, amazing, loving, and good God, how come there is evil in the world? Can I just tell you, hang with me today. Hopefully you have your app open because I want to explain all these to you so when you and I leave here today, we're not going to have all of our questions answered. But for those who have closed your mind, hopefully I will share enough for you to at least open your mind. For those who believe there is a God, I want to encourage you with the truth and the reality that you are right. Look at Romans chapter 1. Let's go to what Paul says when we talk about the creation of the world. Here's what Paul said. He says, for since the creation of the world, what is he saying? All the way back to in the beginning. He says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities. That's what I'm going to look at today. We're going to look at God's word. We're going to look at Genesis and Romans. And we're going to see some of the invisible qualities of a God that we don't see but know exist. He says, in the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, we're going to look at his power, his divine nature, we're going to see what his divine nature is, have been clearly seen, being understood, or you might even write the word observed, from what has been made. Now, let me just stop you right there. That means that you and I and any scientist out there can look at what has been created and has been made, made this universe and world that has been finely tuned, and we can see things about God simply from the creation story. That we are going to see that God is intellectual, He's personal, He's powerful, and He's ultimately eternal. We'll see all that just simply from the created order. Now let's go back and continue to read. He says, have been clearly seen, being understood or observed from what has been made so that people are without excuse. When we step back and think about everything that has been created and the sun and the stars and the moon and the world that we live in and the way we live and our biology uh, and our DNA and how we've been crafted and uniquely and intellectually put together, how could we conclude anything else other than there was an intellectual designer instead of this all happened by chance? Now, as we continue to read, we're without excuse. For although they knew God, but here, what is he saying? He says, there are some people who, although they know there has to be a God because this all couldn't have happened by chance, they will still choose to say there is no God. He says, for although they knew there was a God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile. And their foolish hearts were ultimately darkened. What does it mean? That they chose to put blinders on themselves. Now, you know, when you think about this idea and really just kind of go back uh, to the scientific objections that we talked about, you know, there, we have to be reminded that just because someone calls themselves a scientist does not mean they're going to be objective. It's not that way. Science really doesn't say anything. Scientists do. Scientists can approach the same data, the same thought, the same idea, and ultimately share completely different conclusions. If you happen to think, well, well aren't we all just kind of a, a part of the evolutionary process? And hasn't science told us that basically we're all a part of this macro evolution, naturalistic process. Can I just tell you this? 162 years ago, Charles Darwin wrote The Origin of the Species. 
And the scientific community bought into it. That we all had this common ancestor and there was this macro evolution that took place. Do you want to know? Charles Darwin said there's one weakness in his theory. You want to know what the weakness was? Evidence. <laughs> he acknowledged that there is no archaeological evidence that macroevolution ever took place 162 years ago. But here's what he told his peers that day. Wait, it'll be discovered. 162 years later, if he were here today, he would say, wait. Why? Because the archaeological evidence still doesn't support macroevolution. Now you say, Pastor, do you believe in microevolution? There's a difference. How many of you know between micro and macroevolution? Evolution basically just means change, okay? Um, microevolution, I absolutely believe in it. I believe there are small changes that take place in our bodies. Uh, if you took me, how many of you have noticed a little bit that I'm a little pale complected? I'm kind of a blonde. If you took me and moved me and made me live out in the desert, how many of you think there would be changes that took place in my skin, right? It would darken up just a little bit. It'd probably be melanoma. Uh, but what would never happen in my life is I wouldn't, you wouldn't come and visit me in a decade and I'm a cactus. I would always be a person that underwent small changes in my body and in my genetic code and in my DNA, but I would never become something I'm not. See, the genetic code limits us in the amount of change that can take place. Go read about it. That's why, guess what? Uh, and some of you will probably have this. Anybody ever walked up, you went into someone's house, and they got this little yapping dog or something like that, and you say, hey, what kind of dog is that? And they go, it's a Yorkie poo. What does that mean? You, you, you crossed one dog with another dog, and you got that dog. Or how many of you ever heard of, of a Labradoodle? right? That means you cross one dog with another dog and different breeds created a new breed, right? Guess what? Note, they are still dogs. How many of you know? <laughs> you will never go into someone's house and you go, what is that? And they go, that's a cowawa. <laughs> I crossed my cow with my chihuahua and I got that. <laughs> you won't. You'll never go into someone's house and you go, what is that in the cage? And they'll go, that's a bermoodle. That's my Burmese python that has been crossed with my poodle. That won't happen. You'll say, no, 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 no. The python ate your poodle, right? That's your poodle in the Burmese python right there, right? Now, let me just tell you, the genetic code in our DNA says we can have so much change, but we can never jump from one species to another. That's science, that is absolutely science, and you and I need to understand that and remember that and think of that. Man, as we journey forward and as we think uh, uh, about the problem of evil, man, science limits the amount of change that can take place. And here's the beautiful thing. The more and more we learn about the genetic code and DNA, the less and less it supports the idea of macroevolution. So the archaeological record doesn't show anything related to macroevolution because it didn't happen. You go look in the Bible. What does it say? And God created them according to their kind. And God created this according to their kind. Now, here is another problem. So the science says we are who we are. We can have some changes over time, but we're not going to become something we're not. So then how do you deal with the problem of evil? Evil, And I'll tell you, that is a legitimate problem. If you have an all-powerful, all-amazing, all-gracious, and all-good God, how come there is evil in the world? Genesis chapter 3, we're going to look at it briefly today if we have time. Here's what happened. It says God created this and saw that it was good, and God created this and saw that it was good. God created th this and saw that it was good. Then he took Adam and Eve. He put them together, created male and female, blessed them both, by the way, put them in the Garden of Eden and said, hey, listen, here's one rule. Don't eat from that tree. Now, what did they do? 
Exactly what you and I would have done. Gone and eaten from the tree immediately, right? That's how sin entered into the world. It says in Genesis chapter 3, God put them out of the garden and then began the process of providing a Savior for the sinfulness of the world. Why would God do that? Because God didn't want to create a bunch of robots. See, a loving, gracious person wants to give someone else freedom to make choices, right? There's not a person in this room, hopefully, men, that you don't force your wife to love you. You want her to freely love you. That's what God has chosen with us. He has created us in His image with the desire that you and I would willingly choose to serve Him and worship Him and accept His Son, Jesus Christ, as the payment for salvation. Now, what that does is that leaves the possibility for sin and evil to be in this world. How many of us understand that? So God created a space where some people could reject him and others could accept him. Some people could live according to his commands and some people could live outside of his commands. That is a reality. And so a lot of people will say, man, I just struggle to believe that there's a God because there's evil in the world. Therefore, since there's evil in the world, God doesn't exist. Can I use a couple of current illustrations? How many of you have noticed in the last couple of weeks that some uh, hackers have gotten into Colonial Pipeline Company and shut them down? How many of you know what they, what they do? They send ransomware in there. They shut down the pipeline. I think they stopped about 40% of the East Coast flow of oil. And guess what had to happen? There had to be a payment to the hackers somewhere between 4 and $5 million so they could open the software back up and they could get the oil moving again. Guess what? Some bad actors moved in and shut down some good code. All right. Right before that, some of you may know this, it didn't hit the news as much, but CNA Financial had ransomware attack them. They had to spend $40 million to get access back to their own data. Why? Because there were bad actors who stuck bad code in there and charged a price for it. Now, let me ask you a question. If you had good code and inserted bad code, your natural conclusion is Bill Gates doesn't exist. No. No. See, a lot of times that's what we do. We're saying, if we see all this good, and I will submit to you, there's way more good in this world than there is bad. How many of you understand? There's a lot of bad, but there's way more good than there is bad. So just because you look at something that is bad is taking place, you don't question the existence of the Creator no more than when you and I heard that Colonial Pipeline was shut down with some bad code, or FNA Financial was shut down with a bad code, or apparently they've been looking in our government documents for the last five years with some bad code. Am I the only one that knows that story? I'll carry on. Your natural conclusion wasn't that, well, Bill Gates must not exist. No. It's that something else entered in that wasn't supposed to be there and there had to be a payment to get it out. Oh my goodness, that sounds a little bit like the Bible story that God created you and me in His image and He created and this was good and this was good and this was good and this was good and all of a sudden sin entered into the world and there had to be a payment for God to buy back His created order. And that's the grace and the love of God that is provided for you and me even this day. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1 and let's look at what Genesis 1 verse 1 tells us about this God, his invisible attributes. Genesis 1 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That tells us two things. First of all, that God is eternal. Now that's important. Because back in Charles Darwin's day, they believed that the universe and the earth and matter was all eternal. And their answer used to be, give us billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of years. And eventually the accident called humanity will happen. The problem back then was they had no evidence. The problem today for them is they have less evidence. 
Why? Because scientists between then and now have determined that the universe is not eternal. It had a beginning. Ding, ding. Genesis 1, 1, thousands of years before that said, in the beginning. That is the word that says basically eternity past, God existed. There was never a space, never a time, never a moment that God did not exist. So Scott, God is eternal. In the beginning, here's the second thing that we know. Not only is God eternal, but God is created, creator. It says, in the beginning, God created. Who put all of this together? God did. This didn't, didn't happen by chance. We're going to get to this here in a second. But when you look at the fine-tuning of the universe... It is almost like in the olden days when you used to tank, change the radio dials and you had to get it just in the perfect spot, right? And sometimes if you were like me and you grew up in my house and you had the old antenna wires that you would begin to stick aluminum foil. How many of you remember that? That'll date you a little bit, right? And you're just kind of sitting there holding things. And, and then if it was during football, your dad, you would, you would, you'd move it down. And then if you walked away and the pitcher got worse, dad would say, go stand right there. <laughs> How many of you've missed a game or two? By the way, for those of you who are younger, that was before the day where you can watch it on your phone. But man, you look at this idea that God created the universe and made it for you and me. And it's amazing that God put it all together. Look at what the psalmist said in Psalm 8. The psalmist put it this way. He says, when I consider your heavens, God is creator, God is eternal. He says, when I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers. In other words, man, God, as you fine tune the dial, the moon and the stars that you have set in its place. What an incredible thought. The universe isn't eternal, but something's eternal. Something that was eternal was God. And God put it all into motion. He created Here's the third thing that we see, but God is also powerful. Man, to put all this in order, I love what the psalmist just said, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, it says God basically put the sun in its place with his fingers. The stars and the moon and everything else. You say, pastor, that kind of seems out there. It is out there. It's Godish. The only thing more out there than there was a God who created the universe was that there wasn't a God who created the universe. That requires a blind leap of faith. Is that you and I are sitting here talking about, I'm mainly doing all the talking, whether there is a God or not. And this all happened by accident? No. We have to reflect something that is powerful and personal. Notice the next passage, Psalm 19, verse 1, says that God is not only powerful, but he's intelligent. Notice, it says, the heavens declare of the glory of God, the skies proclaim the works of his hand. Day after day, they pour forth speech, and night after night, they reveal knowledge. What is this telling us? That God is intelligent. That, that I love this idea that the more you and I study and the more scientists study and learn and study and learn, the more they're going to realize how amazingly intricate and intelligent the God who spoke the world into existence is. See, they used to think, man, you know, when, when Darwin was alive, he goes, man, once we realize that the wor world is eternal and we start finding all these archaeological evidences for macroevolution, where species were jumping from one species to another, then we'll have all the answers. And then the problem is they still have no evidence. They still have no proof. And then we said, well, now we're going to start studying the genes and the DNA structure, and we're going to look at all this. And then they came to a place, and they're like, man, this is really cool. It's amazing. Look at how the DNA structure lines up and human genome lines up. And they're like, man. And then all of a sudden, they get to the end, and they said, man, all life's going to come. And they're like, wait. In every cell structure and every DNA, there are limits to change. So that turns out to be a dead end. Is that you see a lot of impressive things. And so then you have someone like Dawkins. 
Richard Dawkins, who, 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 remember, science doesn't say anything, scientists do. He'll say when you look at all the DNA strands and you begin to draw out the genetic code, you will notice that there are certain pieces of all genetic codes, regardless of species, certain segments that are similar. His response is, therefore, that proves without any other evidence that we all came from one genetic source. Or... You get someone like Bill Dembski, who studies intelligent design, who comes to the same conclusion, and he says, no, 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 no. What that tells us is not that we came from one ancestral source. What it tells us is there was probably one designer. How do we track the hackers For the colonial pipeline, for CNA, what happens? They start looking at the code and they say, oh, we've seen this before. And we know who the source is. See, sometimes scientists will come to the genetic code and we say, obviously, there are limits. Because let me just tell you what, Dawkins and everybody else acknowledges Because of our DNA that is found in the cell structure, we can't go from being one thing to another. There can be minor changes. But as you look at the DNA code and the DNA structure and you see pieces that are the same in you and me as they are in a cow, then what you and I need to understand is that, listen, there was a God who created it all and is a common coder who strung it all together, that he created you and me, and he is amazingly, amazingly intelligent. But he's also this, and write this down, he's also a personal God. Look at Genesis chapter 1. This God who is powerful, this God who creates everything. Notice as as we jump down in Genesis chapter 1, it says, Then God said, this is after the creation of the story, He's created light, He's created this, He's created that. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image. I won't go into the Trinitarian talk there in the Hebrew, but there it is. You think about in the New Testament, we see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Look all the way back in Genesis chapter 1. It talks about the plurality of God. We figure out who it is in a later date. But he says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. This is a personal God we're talking about. He says, so God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God. He created them, listen to this, male and female. So this God who is eternal, this God who is powerful, this God who is creator, this God who is intellectual, chose to create male and female. Why? Notice what he says. He created them, and God blessed them. Who's the them? Male and female. God didn't just bless the male. God didn't just bless the female. He blessed both male and female for what purpose? to be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth and subdue it. And ultimately, he says the words, rule over it, the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and the birds and every living creature that moves on the ground. So here's what we know. God is a personal God. That it's almost as if after God, with his amazingly powerful fingers, set the stars in their place and put the sun and the moon and the the earth, put it all together. Then he created all the animals. Then it's almost as if he knelt down and crafted humanity and blessed us. And God is the one who ultimately said, you are of the highest created order. Not from some macro-evolutionary process, but because we were created in the image of God. If you ever question your self-worth, or if someone else ever causes you to question your self-worth, go back to Genesis chapter 1. That the God who put the stars in their place, set the moon in its place, put the earth there, created every other animal in the world created you, created me, 
in his image. That's a personal God. That's a personal God that you and I can celebrate. And you say, Pastor, you mean the God who is eternal and powerful and intellectual and created everything cares about me? Eternally. Even when you feel or if you feel like the whole world has turned its back on you, can I tell you this, that the God who created you in His image cares more about you regardless of where you've been or what you've done or where you grew up or what mistakes you've made, that God cares about you. Look at what the psalmist said. I love it. David, in that, in that moment, in that season in life when he was broken and it's like everybody had turned his back on him. Here's what David, the psalmist said. He says, what is mankind, God, that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? What was the psalmist saying? In his desperate struggle In that night when he put his head down on the stone or the rock or whatever it was out in the cave, that he looked up and he says, God, it seems like no one else loves me. He says, what am I that you care? What am I that you are mindful of me? And God responds, he says, you are my child. David, I made you, I crafted you, I blessed you, I made you in my image. You're a child of God mine. God says, you are my child. Boy, I love, look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. It says, and God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning. It was the sixth day. So now, God created good. God's creation was good. Sin entered into the world. Some people will simply say, you know what? Since there is evil, God can't exist. I will tell you, if that is your simplest argument, then since there is good, God must exist. And there is way more good. So I want you to know God is good. How good is God? That he created you and me, not as robots, Not as some computer program that had to think a certain way and sing a certain way and always say yes. And if and when we were ever ever tempted to do something wrong, that you and I would have some computer code that would say no to this and yes to that. God is so good. God is so loving that he created you and I in his image. We all have that spark, that image. And then he gave us the freedom to choose to live according to his rule and his law, which is ultimately best for humanity and society, or we can reject him and damage ourselves and those around us. See, that's not a bad God. That's a good God. That's a God who creates the opportunity for you and for me to follow him. I, won't, I don't have time, but if you go read Romans chapter 2, it's in there. God says, listen, part of how you know there is a God, it's the fine-tuning of the universe. It is the genetic code that has limits and is specifically crafted for humans to live. But he said, we also kind of have a common conscience. I love what Paul said in Romans chapter 2. He says, you know, those who who are outside the church, those who don't have God's law, they have a conscience in their life that was created and put there. Why? Because they were created in the image of God. Paul says, it doesn't matter if you go to church or not. How many of you know this? A lot of times people say, I don't want to go to church. I feel guilty when I leave. Hey, that just means it's a good sermon. But I want you to know, listen to this. Romans chapter 2 acknowledges since we're all created in the image of God, whether people go to church or don't go to church, based on their lifestyle, when they put their head on their pillow at night, they know whether they did right or did wrong. How many of you understand? Why? Because there's a conscience that bears witness for us or against us based on whether we've done what is right or whether we've done what is wrong. That's what it says. And so God is good. And here's my last thought. God is gracious. Don't ever forget when you look around and you look at the brokenness and sinfulness in the world and you're like, Lord, 
how can this be happening? And there's been a lot over the last year for us to be discouraged about in our country and around the world, and, and things seem to be getting worse and not better. And, and many times we're like, God, when are you going to fix it? Remember the question I talked about early on about destiny? There is coming a day when God is going to fix it. There's coming a day. You say, Pastor, when is that day? I don't know. I'm not God. But God has determined a day. You say, why isn't it today? You want me to tell you why? Look at 2 Peter chapter 3, and this is where we're going to close. Talking about a gracious God, he says, but do not forget this one thing. As we leave here today, dear friends, is what he said. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. Now, let me just stop you. Remember what I first said, God is eternal. You and I think in minutes and seconds and days and weeks and months, God thinks in eternity. And so he says, but one thing, don't forget this, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. He says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. What is God's promise? That there is going to come a day when he's going to return and he's going to remove all the evil out of this world. That is God's promise. That is God's promise. You say, when is that going to happen? He says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, instead, everybody say instead. He is patient with us, not wanting any to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Why hasn't God kept his promise yet of removing sin and evil from the world? Because he's a gracious God. See, had God come a couple days ago, 50 students wouldn't have been able to stand right here and accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord like they did last night. If God were to come today, probably 75 or 100 kids at VBS wouldn't have the opportunity to trust Christ as Savior and Lord. So next time you step back and say, God, how can you allow all this evil to happen? Remember, it's because God is gracious. God is loving. And God is patient. But the real question is not what about someone else. The biggest question is what about you? Have you ever come to a place where you've trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the preponderance of the evidence that our universe is finely tuned by an amazing, powerful, and intellectual God that even in our DNA, the structure limits us to being the one creature that was made in the image of God. That God, even though there is sin and evil in the world, you are a patient and a gracious God. Putting up with the sins of many, but also putting up with my sins. God, as we leave here today, I pray that we would be emboldened to leave here knowing that just because there's evil in the world, it doesn't eliminate the fact that there is a God who is good, who has promised there is coming a day that he's going to fix it all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.